That's me when I was five. My dad made me play scuba tanks out of old oatmeal containers. I wore them on my back when I watched Sihan on television. As a matter of fact, the women have an advantage over the men since they usually have a smaller pair of lungs they can get more mileage out of a tank of air. I've been collecting bottles now for 15 years. The seal on that bottle is the seal of the last king of Prussia who was crowned in the year 1887. Actually, I find the sharks to be very beautiful creatures. The Gulf of Mexico, gateway to the oil rigs. Houston, Texas, oil capital of the world and home of the Johnson Space Center. Bill Gleason, who is 55, has a PhD in chemistry. During the week, he works for an oil company. His favorite weekend activity is scuba diving with his wife, Doris. We looked for something that we could do together since being able to share the same experiences. It's one of the things that's held our marriage together for 29 years. And since Houston is oriented towards water sports, diving was a natural possibility. So we looked into that and got certified through the YMCA here and then uh, got involved with one of the major dive clubs in the Houston area, which is the Houston Underwater Club. It's Friday afternoon. Bill and Doris are heading for the Gulf of Mexico to go diving. Hi, my darling. Hi. I'll go ahead and change my clothes and we'll head on out. Hi. Doris is 65, 10 years older than Bill, but she passed her recent physical with flying colors. The doctor said I had the body of a 40-year-old, um, maybe internally, not externally. <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico is dotted with oil rigs. Functioning as artificial reefs, they attract an incredible variety of marine life. Almost every weekend, charter and private boats carry divers from 25 to 100 miles from shore in search of the perfect rig dive. Bill and Doris gear up in dynamic, state-of-the-art, fashionable equipment. Doris slips into the 80-degree water. Bill follows a few seconds later with underwater camera in hand. Visibility can be 150 feet. Diving gives Bill a very special sense of fulfillment. The fulfillment I get really starts probably with the spiritual touch of being able to see the sheer variety of the Lord's creation there. One of the other things is the sensation of complete weightlessness. I can really appreciate what the astronauts are like because when you're neutrally buoyant into there, you can move in any dimension that you want and feel completely free. And that sense of freedom that you have underwater is nothing you can ever get for the earthbound person up on the surface. And then just the sheer beauty that we see down there as well, and to be able to share that together. Bill and Doris have made many friends diving. Their dive club in Houston has over 400 members. To Doris, diving is also special. It is something that has given me a lot of uh, confidence in myself, which I did not have. It has also improved my self-image, and uh, I feel that I am uh, uh, able to do a lot of other things uh, and be challenged by them in other areas because of the confidence and um, assurance that I've gained through diving. One of the other divers snags a fish for a barbecue later. Gulf divers are conservation-minded, taking only what they can eat and eating all they take. Since they can see what they're getting, they spear only those fish they know are good eating and the right size for a meal. Spear fishermen find the hunt challenging and exciting, and being able to provide a fresh seafood supper is a great satisfaction. Doris enjoys a solitary moment. It's always... Um new and different each time we dive. And as I'm swimming among the struts of the rigs and uh, look out and see the wonderful view and um, the sea life, I 
get the feeling that I am in the I am the one who is in the aquarium and the fish going by are the observers watching me. A barracuda stops at eye level to check out Doris. The fish's bad reputation is fiction, not fact. I did a lot of photography above water, and it was just a natural to carry that interest underwater and the colors that you have in the corals and the fish and things of that nature, which you just never see to that extent above water, which has really challenged me. Just the sheer variety in colors that you see really drives us back time and time and time again. I really am down there just for the sheer enjoyment of what I see and to be with my husband. Normally, you have the coral reef below you, what have you, and you're swimming over it, around it. But here, you're actually in part of the whole ecosystem itself. And with the light coming down through the various struts in the oil rigs, you almost feel like you're in a surrealistic painting or something like that. And when you come back to the boat and swapping stories about what you've seen, and then finally sitting down and eating some of that fish that was moving around just a short time before down there, it's really about the most perfect way to end the day you could ever ask for. Yes, it's easy to see why the Gleasons and their friends enjoy diving in the Gulf of Mexico. There aren't many better ways to spend a day. It's a social activity with no age limits. It's good friends, good food, and fantastic sunsets. Just a perfect way to end a wonderful day. Lake Superior. Wisconsin, America's Dairyland. In the fall, autumn's palette dabbles the trees surrounding the Great Lakes with color. The lakes are a mecca for wreck divers. Ferocious storms have sent many a hapless vessel to the bottom. Beneath the surface, cold, fresh water that preserves these wrecks so well makes comfortable dry suits a necessity. Wreck exploration is a fascinating way of bringing history alive for many divers. Bill Steinborn, 44, is a Great Lakes diver with a special hobby. He lives in Rockford, Illinois with his wife, Jan, and two children. Jan's brother, Ed, is visiting for a week. Bill? Hi, pal. Good to see you. Good. We gonna do some diving? Yeah, I'm ready when you are. All right. The kids are learning to dive, and Jan is an ardent snorkeler. Let's go in and have a cold one. Got it. Bill's special hobby is bottle diving. These are the bottles you're telling me about, huh? Well, these are some of the nicer ones. I've probably got another 500 in storage that I don't have room to display. Uh, where'd you get all these ribbons? My dive club each year has a show, and these are the ribbons I got by displaying the bottles at that particular show. How can you tell if you do indeed have a valuable bottle? Well, in order to have a valuable bottle, you have to absolutely be able to identify the bottle as far as the product and the company that made it. So the embossing and the raised lettering on the glass is absolutely critical. And then you go to a, a source book or, or a group of people that collects that specific bottle, and they can give you information, and then you'll find out whether it's valuable or not. Hey, Bill, are they difficult to find? No, they're not hard to find. You need to be very effective in searching underwater, but beyond that, it takes no special talent or no special diving equipment to, uh, to go out and have fun and find bottles. Lake Geneva, a popular lake for diving and boating, is an hour from Bill's house, just over the Wisconsin border. Bill's favorite time to dive it is the fall, when the lake is all but deserted and underwater visibility is at its peak. Although the water is cool, the divers will keep warm in lightweight, comfortable dry suits. I got interested in diving as a child. I read uh, some of Riesenberg's books uh, on hard hat diving and just uh, picked up the interest as I went along and began snorkeling as a youngster. And, as soon as I was old enough to take diving lessons, I did. Uh, I became an instructor, really, to keep my diving knowledge current and also to uh, have a chance to meet people and, and, and share my interpretation of the sport and, in, in a sense, repay, repay what the sport has given to me. I have a prescription mask for uh, seeing underwater. I have no problem with the vision uh, using that mask and I'm able to find uh, very, very small things, uh, so obviously it works well. Years ago, before people were concerned with pollution, any body of water was a dumping ground. Among the things discarded were bottles. Yesterday's junk is treasure for today's divers. But finding bottles underwater takes a practiced eye. 
They are rarely found on top of the sand, usually beneath it. Some bottles are very valuable, selling for thousands of dollars. I have sold some of the bottles only because I was approached and asked to, to sell the bottles. I didn't get into bottle collecting as a way to fund my diving, although it's, it would be a potential. Uh, but I, I do it just to enjoy it, and I don't actively seek out buyers for the bottles. My current interests uh, obviously still lie in collecting bottles. Uh, I am now taking photographs as well in salt water, mostly, and uh, doing a lot of wreck diving. Ed has never been bottle diving before and hasn't quite mastered the technique. The flag lets boaters know there are divers below. Bill bags another bottle, his fifth this dive. Ed is beginning to get a little discouraged. Time after time, his might-be treasure dissolves in a cloud of silt. Rocks and shells and bits of debris, but no more bottles? Despite nothing to show for his efforts yet, Ed can feel it in his bones. There's got to be a couple Bill has missed. Ah, success. Ed's careful search is finally rewarded. He's sure his find is a good one. Bill, meanwhile, is filling a lift bag with air from an accessory hose attached to his regulator to help bring his heavy load of bottles to the surface. Ed is very excited about his find. Look at this thing. How fascinating. With just a brush of a hand, a diver could hold a bottle of Dr. X's Swamp Root Kidney Cure and conjure up images of life a hundred years ago. Yeah, it looks really good. It's gotta be worth a few bucks, huh? Let me get the book and uh, we'll check it out. Has Ed really found something valuable? It seems as though treasure fever has set in. I think I've seen that bottle in this book. There. Okay, here it is. Look at that. All right. Hey, it's scarce. Yeah, see the embossing is the very same as what's drawn in the book. The bottle is worth about $15. Let's go get a quick bite to eat. All right, but let's hurry up, huh? I want to get back here. <laughs> nice move, Slick. New Jersey, the Garden State. 20-year-old Rusty Cassway is a Pennsylvania college student with a passion for wreck diving. As long as I can remember, I've always been interested in the sea and in diving. That's me when I was five. My dad made play scuba tanks for me out of oatmeal containers. And I wore them on my back when I watched Sea Hunt on television. Now, of course, I've graduated to the real thing. That's me with my buddy Tim after we recovered a porthole from the wreck of the Sand Gill. Man, I love diving so much. I especially love shipwreck diving. Naturally, I'm a collector, too. Here we have a bell from the Arundo, formerly the Petersfield before it was rechristened. Oftentimes, they don't recast a bell when they rename a ship. This is what my porthole looks like after it's all cleaned up. But of course, I put a mirror in it. But this sextant from a German submarine is my prized possession. Deep wreck diving off the Jersey coast is kind of specialized. It's not like diving in the Florida Keys. You wear a lot more gear, you gotta stay warm. A lot more safety gear also. We carry up lines to come up on so we can control our ascent rate. We carry lift bags for artifacts. We carry bug bags for all those lobsters we see. Sometimes we carry two or three bug bags. You don't want the big lobsters damaging the little ones. My friend Evie's been diving a long time. We buddy dive together quite often. She taught me many things. Some of the things that wouldn't just be common sense. How to keep all the safety gear together and simple ways to be comfortable underwater. Rusty's dive buddy, Evelyn, is 41 years old. A Pennsylvania dive shop owner she has been diving East Coast wrecks for 23 years. Quite often, the visibility off the New Jersey coast is quite good. But sometimes, on the deeper wrecks, it gets quite dark. 
Because of this, we're required to use brighter lights, safety lines, and it's really important to dive with a buddy. For many, one of the rewards of wreck diving is the recovery of artifacts. Most avid wreck divers have brass fever, defined as the love of brass objects. One treasured artifact is not brass, but wood. This ship's wheel is almost seven feet high. The ultimate challenge will be bringing it to the surface for restoration. After I graduate from college, I plan on being an all-around entrepreneur. I don't like working for other people, but I love to dive. I don't know if I'd want to work in the diving industry. I'd like to keep it as an avocation, not a vocation. I'd love to keep diving as something I want to do, not that I have to do. A month ago, while diving the same wreck, Rusty found the front part of a porthole called a window. Today, he finds a porthole backing plate. While Evie checks their time, depth, and remaining air, Rusty prepares to send his portal to the surface. I've really made my sport pay for itself. I've sold many of my artifacts to support my diving habit. Portholes are usually securely attached to the ship's hull. Finding one lying on the bottom is an incredible piece of luck. They can weigh as much as 60 pounds, and bringing one to the surface is no easy feat. Every wreck diver carries a lift bag, which is inflated with an accessory hose. The porthole is attached to both the lift bag and an upline. The upline keeps it from drifting away once it reaches the surface. Although many wreck divers get tremendous satisfaction from restoring and displaying their shipwreck artifacts, the sale of these items can be lucrative. Fully restored portholes can bring up to $500. But to most divers, they are priceless mementos of wreck diving adventures. The best New Jersey wrecks are several miles offshore, making travel by boat a necessity. Locating a wreck can be difficult. Many divers prefer to dive off charter boats. Their experienced captains and knowledgeable crews make diving safe, comfortable, and fun. Good dive. Oh, man. Boy, Evie, this is terrific. I can't believe it. I can't believe that you found the backing plate just laying there on the sand. I know. Man, that window I found, I know it's going to fit. I know it. You know, it's so much work to get one of these off. And you know, if the window doesn't fit, they do come in different sizes. Oh, man, this is Not great. to bum me out. Yeah, well, I'm sure it'll fit. I know it's going to fit. I know. You're so lucky. Oh, you just have all the luck in the world. Yeah. No, this is really sharp. Man, yeah. this is great. I know it's going to fit. It's got to. Good job. Good. A real prize. Hey. This is almost as exciting as flopping around on the floor as a kid wearing oatmeal containers on my back while watching Sea Hunt. California, the Golden State. California's rugged coastline and its eight offshore channel islands are a playground for scuba divers. Underwater, lush kelp forests provide shelter and sustenance to a great variety of marine life. Using sophisticated equipment, tens of thousands of divers enjoy these temperate waters each year. Thirty-four-year-old Elaine Holland, a Los Angeles attorney, has been diving for nine years. I was looking for some kind of activity that I could do as a relief from the tension of law school. I have a bad knee, so I didn't think I could do tennis or skiing. Diving was something that was exciting and interesting, and I could physically do it. At first, I was just sightseeing, because everything was so new and so beautiful. Then the longer I've been diving, the more things I find to do. Hello? Hi, Pam. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the trip this weekend. OK, yeah, I could meet you about 6 o'clock at the boat. See you then. Bye-bye. Elaine and her friend Pam Jordan are planning a weekend shark dive in the Catalina Channel. I've been interested in sharks ever since I read the book by Dr. Eugenie Clark, Lady with a Spear. Dr. Clark is a world authority on sharks. What I'd like to talk to you first about is the cage and where it will be and, and what you can expect. We're going to lower the cage over the uh, port side 
Dive shop owner Bud Riker specializes in shark diving expeditions off Southern California. So you have no problems with really with, with losing the cage. Uh, Marty will enter first and then ask you to come on in. Well, then want you a cage is always used when sharks and divers are in the water together. It provides a refuge for resting, getting used to conditions, or making equipment adjustments. It's large enough for two divers to swim in comfortably without getting hung up on the cage. Pam and Elaine, you're going to go as the first Betty group. And you'll Along to answer questions and act as a guide is underwater photographer and veteran shark diver, Marty Snyderman. I'll put a hand up and give you a signal. This is not a question. This means, come on, let's go now. Jump in the water and I will... Marty explains how the dive will proceed. From what I can tell topside, we've got about three or four blue sharks swimming around the boat, and that's certainly what we'd expect. Blues are the most common of the open ocean sharks seen off the coast of Southern California. There is a chance, though, that we could see some The sharks are attracted to a bait box hung off the side of the boat. I'm going to give you a signal like this, and also intended for Bud. And what we'd like to do is just, it's not in, meant to communicate danger, but it's just so that you'll have an opportunity to realize there's another animal around. I'd like you to be able to see it. What other types of sharks might we see today? A uh, good possibility, uh, Elaine, that we could see mako sharks, possibility of a hammerhead. Certainly those would be the two other species this time of year that we might expect to see out in open water like this. You won't have any trouble telling them apart. Uh, blues are a very sleek and graceful animal. Makos have a very stocky build and, of course, hammerheads with that unusual head. You'll be able to tell them apart as long as you know to look at them. There won't be any, any trouble in distinguishing between the species. Marty wears a special shark-proof chainmail suit. Constructed of stainless steel, it weighs about 20 pounds. With more than 200 shark dives to his credit, Marty has never had an uncomfortable experience. He works closely with sharks, photographing and filming them, and in this case, acting as a dive guide. Elaine and her buddy, flight attendant Pam Jordan, are first in the water. The women swim to the cage to get oriented. Just outside, Marty checks to make sure everything is okay. You never know what to expect when you get into the water with this many sharks for the first time. But when I realized they weren't biting Marty, it was easy and very exciting to get out into the open water with them. Pam is first to venture outside the cage for a one-on-one -on -one shark encounter with Marty. In all the years I've been diving here off Southern California, I've never seen a shark other than on these trips where we deliberately bait them in. If we hadn't brought the bait with us, chances are we wouldn't have seen one shark. The shark's natural diet consists mainly of fish. Hollywood has done a disservice to sharks because they are big box office. They are not the man-eating, vindictive creatures portrayed in some movies. Under conditions such as these, they are easily approachable. Now it's Elaine's turn. Typical of many other professional women her age, Elaine is well-educated, independent and self-supporting. To relieve the stresses of her high-pressure job, she seeks relaxation and adventure in her off hours. Diving provides both. Her friends topside eagerly await their turn. Oftentimes, the smaller sharks are more inquisitive than the larger ones. They can still give you a nip, the important thing is to act aggressively when they get too close. I'm a relatively new photographer. Wait till the folks back home see these pictures. They won't believe it. Elaine heads back to the cage. Marty has promised her and Pam a special show. He's going to hand feed a shark for them. You'd think that anyone who deliberately stick his arm into the mouth of a shark isn't playing with the full deck. But with the chainmail suit on, Marty is fully protected. And besides, he knows how badly Pam and I wanted to get some action pictures. Marty motions the women out of the cage and escorts them back to the boat. The 
the dive is over. Elaine and Pam will certainly have an interesting story to relate to their friends and family. Hey, how was that for excitement? It was great. It was fantastic. Are there a lot of sharks? Yeah, oh, could about ten of them. Did you really? see it from up here? Yeah. Oh, there was one of them that came right up in our face down there. Oh, right. How yeah. were they, were they I'd say a couple of them yeah. were close to seven to eight feet. Yeah. A bunch of smaller ones and then two great big ones sort of were cruising around on the outside. That's great. Yeah. Great. Got some super pictures. I hope. I hope. <laughs> At least it went off. Are you yeah. ready to do it again? Oh, yes. Oh. Anytime. One of diving's ultimate thrills, a carefully orchestrated shark encounter, is an adventure never to be forgotten. I find the sharks to be very beautiful creatures. Scuba diving in America. Rigs, wrecks, Treasure and once feared sharks are just part of a great experience that includes new friends and wonderful new discoveries. <laughs>